So there are two separate issues to talk about. One is why we should feel free of national debt. The, the title of the book, Freedom, really means you don't have to do anything except understand the issue better. Once you understand the issue better, you, you can stop worrying about it. Once you reach that point, then there are a whole separate set of issues of what do you do. And people can legitimately debate, them, and sometimes not so legitimately, uh, debate about what, uh, what we ought to do. But that's sort of a, a separate topic. I'll give you some of my views, which again emphasize infrastructure. But uh, the first and the main point is just intellectually, what is the basis for this great fear about national debt? It really is important. Uh, I, I think a lot of you believe that ideas influence policy and even politics, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But the underlying intellectual basis for the fear of national debt and how that fear then translates into a huge number of policy uh, decisions that are made in Washington, D.C. and in capitals all around the world uh, are just extraordinarily important. And I, they, the point, the main point of this book, the reason I wrote it, is because I think the intellectual underpinnings of the way that people traditionally look at what's called national debt are flawed, uh, seriously flawed. And uh, understanding is, is the key. So what's been the practical effect of these fears? Well, it's kept us from doing a lot of things. It's made our economic growth needlessly slow in comparison to places like China who didn't worry about it. It's harmed uh, education, environment, uh, you know, defense, whatever it is that you think is good that the government might be doing, even lowering taxes. Um, the fear of the national debt has interfered uh, with that, and it's just needless. So the way the book approaches things, and the way I've been thinking about them, is to say, well, why is it that people have this great fear about national debt? Um, and to look at the main reasons, the things that are typically said, and say, well, do they hold water or not? And obviously my conclusion is they don't hold water. It, this stuff is really contrary. It, I, and I have to tell you that, because you hear it so often, all these uh, almost sometimes moralistic statements about how we have to contain the national debt, and it's a, we have to get our fiscal house in order, whatever that means. Sounds like a good thing, but a little, little loosey-goosey to me. Um, Mark Twain had this great quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Uh, and that, that's a fun way to, to think about these issues. Um, I did want to mention thanks to Bob Solo, who's, uh, it, even though uh, the vast majority of the academic economists around the world are still on this national debt concern, there are a few people who broke it free of it. Uh, some of them actually, uh, Rowan and, and Rohan have brought here. But uh, Bob Solo has been my advisor. He's a very highly respected uh, sort of elder statement, statesman of academic uh, economics. And he, uh, he really thinks this makes sense. I, I asked him jokingly, I said, Bob, is it okay with you if I tell people that you think this makes sense because it's so contrary to what your, a lot of your uh, colleagues are saying all over the place? And he said, I'm not running for office, and, he said, uh, and I think you got it right, so fine. Tell them, tell them that I think you got it right. So thanks uh, to Bob. So what does national debt mean in the United States? It means U.S. Treasury security. So if you say it that way, it doesn't sound so evil. But national debt has, has just a funny term. It has implications that people think of in terms of their personal debt that just don't apply. And that's one of the things that the, the book tries to bring out. Actually, there are 50 million Americans who have money invested in, uh, in U.S. treasuries. So I, I jokingly here suggest that why don't we just change the term, call it national capital, like the capital of a corporation, instead of calling it debt. Okay, just a few things because then we're going to move on the main, the main time today. I hope we'll do a discussion and Q&A. First thing is, the government is different. You hear these, these uh, comments about people say, well, you and I and our family has to make sure that our, our income and our revenue are balanced. And if you're running a small business or a farm, 
you have to make sure that you have enough income to cover your expenses. And therefore, the federal government needs to do the same thing. Well, that's a, a cute, kind of quaint way of looking at things. It just isn't true. And it's a huge leap to jump from a family to the entire United States government. Uh, and there are lots of things in the world where there are components of a larger entity that are subject to certain constraints, but the larger entity itself is not. And it's, uh, you know, it's a concept, I'm sure, that as you study the law, that, that you run into frequently. But this is something that sounds great, but uh, in fact is not true. And in fact, it, it's almost, it almost never occurs. So the people who say, well, we have to do this, have lost sight of the fact that it almost never happens. Okay, the government, and the government here and governments around the world very, very rarely take in as much revenue as they, 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 they have to spend. So there's got to be something else going on here that, that needs to be understood. doesn't mean deficits don't matter. It means you have to say, well, why do they matter? What's going on? Deficits are important to help support the economy when unemployment is high, and if you've got a really hot economy, which we hope we'll have sometime in the future, when, when uh, medical expense, uh, medical, Medicare, for example, may be higher, then you have to worry that too much of a deficit could cause inflation. So there are things to worry about, but they need to be put in perspective. Another thing you hear is, well, we've got this great burden we're, we're laying on our, our children and our grandchildren. They're going to have to pay huge taxes in order to repay the debt. Well, again, it's just not true. And it has never been true. The United States has had uh, debt outstanding ever since Alexander Hamilton for 220 years and never fully paid it off. You pay off an individual instrument, but never pay it off in aggregate. And the amount of taxes that we're paying this year to pay down the national debt in aggregate is zero. Zero last year, zero next year. Two of my children are here today. Don't worry, you won't have to pay for it, okay? And, and, and our grandchildren won't. It's just not going to happen. It's just the, the wrong concept. And it, it's funny, people keep talking about it, again, without saying, wait a minute, this doesn't happen. Why do we think it's going to happen in the future? What's going to be different? It, it's just a long, uh, strange concept. In fact, the people who put together the budgets in Washington never even plan on it including the most conservative budgets, the budgets that come out of the most conservative uh, bodies in Washington, have a budget that reduces the deficit over time. But if you look over a 30-year period, they do not plan to repay the $12 trillion worth of, of Treasury securities outstanding. They don't plan to repay any of it. So even though on one side of the mouth they say, oh, this is a great burden because we have to pay it back, on the other side, when they actually present a budget, they present a budget that pays down zero. And that's just the, the way it is. Another interesting way to think about it, we could maybe come back to this in the Q&A, is government issues other kinds of paper. They issue $20 bills, okay? That never has to be paid back. Okay, um, another big thing is people say, well, the United States is going to head to Greece. We're, we're going to have the same problems the Eurozone countries had because we, we issued too many treasuries. Um, but it's very different. And again, the book tries to explain this. Euros can move from one country to another. U.S. dollars live in the United States, in the U.S. financial system. It's the only place they can live. And they get recycled around in, in, a, in a country that has its own monetary system, its own currency, its own central bank. The U.S., the U.K., China, Japan. Uh, these you see often people say, "Well, the ratio of debt to GDP is getting too high." And a couple of the, a couple of Harvard professors published a, a book on it, and there was some controversy about their Excel sheets. But the the main problem is that the concept is wrong. There's just no rationale for it. There's no logical reason for being concerned about that particular ratio for a country that has its own currency and can print money and can can create money. So I, I think it's more important to step back and look at the total set of financial assets in the, in the country, uh, which is like $180 trillion. And there are lots of different financial assets. Some of them are money, some of them are treasuries, some of them are, are, are bonds, uh, stocks, all kinds of different things. Okay.
Then there's the myth of the, this is the last one I'll cover today, the myth of the bond vigilantes. This is the people who every year for many years have said, aha, we're issuing so many treasuries that the markets are going to rebel. They're not going to be willing to buy them. The interest rates are going to be driven way up. The, the, the bond uh, investors just won't sell them. Well, it didn't happen. Then the next year, they say, well, it didn't happen last year, but this year it's going to happen. It didn't happen. Next year it's going to happen. It never happens. And, and I keep thinking if, if we had a weatherman on TV who constantly was predicting a giant storm, and the giant storm never came, we might say, you know, maybe his meteorological model has a flaw in it. Maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with the way he's thinking about the issues, and we need to step back and rethink it. But people don't give up. They keep saying, well, yeah, it didn't happen last year, but it'll happen next year. And in fact, the logic is flawed. It will never happen. It can never happen. And it's just fundamentally wrong. Another thing, uh, Raul referred to this earlier, you have to step back and think, well, what does money mean? Money is it's hard to define. It can be defined in lots of different ways. The way it's typically defined for reporting purposes when people talk about the money supply is basically money in banks. But bank money is a liability of commercial banks. They're at risk. You know, this is just another form of financial asset. It's not as if money, in that sense, is some... God-given thing of, of, of absolute certainty. It's just a liability of a commercial bank which may or may not be good. And in fact, in 2008, there was a lot of worry that they would not be good. People were starting to, to uh, panic and have runs on some banks. Uh, and the U.S. government came to the rescue. How did the U.S. government come to the rescue? With U.S. Treasuries financing. Money, the government put money into banks to, to shore them up. Where did the U.S. government get the money? from U.S. Treasuries. U.S. Treasuries are far, far the safest, most liquid thing that, that you can invest in U.S. dollars in, and will continue to be that, despite all the, the shenanigans going around in, in uh, Congress right now. People have the wrong concept of Treasury options. They say, well, why should we take our good money and give it to the U.S. government when we're not sure what, how solid that's going to be? It's exactly the opposite. What's happening is people have money in banks, especially big players. If you look at where the big money is, if you've got $100 million or $100 billion, okay, you don't want to keep it in a bank. It's just too risky. So people have to go look and say, well, I will buy all the treasuries that, that exist. The, the big players do that. And if there aren't enough treasuries to go around, I'll have to leave some money in the bank, but I really don't want to do that. So it's a different way of thinking. This, I'm almost done here. These are just some other points that um, that are pointed out in the bank. The, the, one of the key things is that, that this is really odd. That in Washington, there's this great focus on the cumulative deficit over 10 years. When people talk about things, because they, they're afraid of building up the, the national debt, and they say, "Well, you know, we've got this program, and how much is it going to cost over over 10 years?" And they're missing the point. Uh, they're trying to get prepared for the future when, when Medicare, for example, is going to be a much higher expense. But that's a little bit like saying, well, we expect it's going to be cold in January. And in order to be prepared for that, we will start wearing our sweaters now. Okay? Or wearing them in August. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's because it's not your average body warmth that matters. It, it matter, what matters is your body warmth at the time when things go on. So to plan ahead for 10 years to use the cumulative amount of money over that period of time is simply the wrong measure. People are, are just focused on the wrong thing. Then the last thing is, what do you do once you think you're free? I, I, I try to emphasize for people, I'm a private sector guy. I'm not trying to, to push the government uh, into taking a, a bigger role unless it absolutely has to. And I think the private sector is a wonderful thing for America and will continue to be. But there is a positive role for government. Uh, I particularly, as I mentioned, like infrastructure, it can, it can keep the unemployment from getting too big and can provide um, extraordinarily important investment for the nation that can, can be uh, used in the future. Okay, thank you.